and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, you might recall that you were invited to submit some of your most burning questions for, uh, for me to answer. And I understand that we had over 10,000 of them submitted. I'm afraid I won't have time to get through all of those, but uh, I think I'm equipped to answer a few of those. I have my trusty penicillin at hand. I understand this is a delicious concoction of whiskey, ginger, lemon, and something else I forget. But. Yes, anyway, that's uh, going to fuel me through the rest of this. So you might want to take hold of your own trusty penicillin, and I hope you uh, enjoy that as well. This is going to be fun. Question one, has the story changed from how you thought it would go? Well, uh, it kind of had to because I didn't have any idea how it would go. I wrote Outlander as a practice novel, and I had nothing in mind. I just uh, wanted to learn how to write a novel. It didn't matter what kind, but I thought historical fiction would be the easiest for me as I was a university professor. I knew my way around a library, and I thought it would be easier to look things up than make them up, and if I had no imagination, I could steal things from the historical record which works pretty well. So that's what I did, essentially. And uh, then things happened in the course of writing, which I kind of went along with. And next thing you knew, I had uh, this odd book, which nobody knew how to sell, because it couldn't be quali uh, qualified as any genre or another. You know, it kind of has all of the genres. And so far, I have seen my books sold as fiction, literary fiction, science fiction, uh, military fiction, fantasy, uh, mystery, um, romance, uh, LGBTQ fiction, and horror. This is true, I actually beat George R. R. Martin for a, uh, a Quill Award in fantasy, science fiction, and horror category. So I'll take that one. Okay, so anyway, the story just kind of evolves under me. I don't plan stories ahead of time, and I don't write them in a straight line. I write where I can see things happening and lots of things do happen. So yeah, the story has certainly changed. <laughs> I just don't know how in advance. And question number two, what does a typical writing day look like for you? Okay, this would be a day where I am actually just staying home writing and nothing else weird is happening. Last Wednesday, for instance, uh, Good Morning America came round to infest my living room. And uh, so everything was kind of ups and downs through the entire day owing to having a film crew in the living room and you know, having to come by and, and you know, talk. But if I were just left to my own devices, um, I would probably get up around nine, by preference. I am a night owl, I work at night. My husband is a lark and he doesn't. So he goes to bed around nine at night. I uh, tuck him in and then I go lie down with the dogs and a book. I fall asleep in 10 minutes, but then I wake up again around midnight and go upstairs to work. I work until about 4.30 in the morning when I start shutting down the office, and I go and crawl back in bed with my husband around 5. He then gets up around 6.30, so, you know, we spent a good hour and a half together in bed. And uh, then I, I will wake up again around 9 in the morning. So that's about it. Um, how do you choose a book title? Um, I don't know. Uh, some books kind of name themselves. Like Voyager, I mentioned before, I knew that was the name of that particular book because of the long voyage, you know, that I knew they were going to undertake to get into the new world. The other books, um, Outlander took forever. It was originally called Cross Stitch, uh, which I had in mind just because I thought Claire was going to, you know, cross into the past and then cross back into the future in that book. Uh, that's not what happened, so Cross Stitch didn't really work, but that's what it was called. So we sold it in the US and they said, well, cross stitch sounds like embroidery. Can you think of something more exciting? So it took 11 months to come up with Outlander, <laughs> at which point they said, oh good, it's only one word, it won't block the art. Uh, meanwhile, in the UK, they said, well, to us, Outlander means someone from South Africa. Can you think of something better? <laughs> and I said, well, I did call it cross stitch. And they said, oh, lovely, and called it that. So I have gotten various, uh, letters over the years from people in the UK and Australia and New Zealand saying there's this funny story about how I found your first novel. I was in the bookshop and looking through the craft section and it was under embroidery. So yeah, uh, otherwise it's, it's kind of like rock polishing. You take little words and throw them in the back of your mind and things come up. What is one thing you can't live without? Well, 50-50 is either my husband or Diet Coke. You know, good luck, I can have them both. 
Uh, what is your favorite Outlander-inspired recipe? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm assuming that you might mean those from uh, Teresa's fabulous cookbooks. Uh, my favorite so far is one from uh, Lord John's Lunchbox, it's called, and it is a uh, breast of duck marinated in its fabulous marmalade sauce served with a German potato salad, which is uh, spiced with vinegar and small pickled onions. Yeah, it's terrific. Okay, well, speaking of Lord John, well, we get to see more Lord John and Percy in future books. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, um, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, I don't want to be more specific than that. The answer is um, yes for the time being. All right, which Outlander character would you most likely be friends with and why? Well, that might be Denzel uh, Hunter, Rachel's brother. Uh, he's the young Quaker physician whom we met uh, and saw to some degree in, uh, in, in Moby. That's what I call written in my own heart's blood. He's a physician, what they called a fighting Quaker, meaning that he did uh, subscribe to Quaker principles, which means that you're against killing things, or killing people at any rate. Um, but he uh, also felt very strongly about the principles of liberty. And he wanted you know, to lend his efforts to the revolution, but without killing people if he possibly could. So he joins the army as a military surgeon. And uh, so he has uh, the sorts of military experiences you might expect, except that he's not armed and he doesn't kill people, which puts him in considerable danger of his own life most of the time. Now, meanwhile, he has fallen in love with uh, the daughter of uh, Lord John's elder brother, Harold, Duke of Pardlow, is of course not at all pleased that his uh, daughter has married this penniless Quaker physician. You know, Quakers were considered to be not quite the thing in London. And uh, he's, uh, there's been a little bit of family trouble. Let's just say that the family trouble kind of continues in this book, not necessarily focused on Denzel. But I think I would be friends with him, not only because of his, uh, his curiosity and attitude toward medicine and science in general, but because of his generosity of spirit, you know, and his genuine friendliness toward, you know, just about anybody. <laughs> but he also is a man of deep and serious purpose, you know, so while he, you know, can certainly uh, be a, a, a nice companion to have a drink with on occasion, he will also be willing to discuss the state of the universe with you in all seriousness. Okay. So if you were to start another series, what would it be about? I assume you mean start writing it rather than reading it. I have lots of series that I like to read. But uh, what would it be about? Hmm. Well, uh, there's Master Raymond. I intend to uh, write his story, Should I Live Long Enough? That would probably be the next series. I mean, Lord John has his uh, series, which is ongoing. So uh, it would probably be about Mr. Master Raymond. But you never know, things pop up. What is your favorite part about releasing a new book? Well, that's hard to say. I mean, there's this uh, sense of exquisite relief that it's done, you know. <laughs> it is actually like delivering a rather large baby, though, uh, only slightly less painful. Uh, but uh, there's also the fact that you're releasing it to uh, a an exuberant welcome from the people who have been waiting for it. So, you know, it's very gratifying to be able to, you know, show you the new creation and, uh, and uh, sort of put it in your hands. And hope you all enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Will the mystery of Jamie's ghost ever be solved? Yes. Other than the conversations included in the books, what sort of questions does Jamie ask Claire about 20th century life? What fascinates him most about the future? Well, now that's an interesting question. It, he tends to ask her questions that uh, have some personal significance to what he's doing right then, you know, as in how do people manage this in your time? And there's one spot, I believe, in this new book where they're discussing, you know, Benedict Arnold and uh, soldiering and the raising of a militia and things like that. And he's asking her, well, you know, how would it be done, you know, in the 20th century? I know how it's done now, but what do they do then? You know, how do people go about this? Do they have a better idea than what I'm doing now? <laughs> to which he's forced to oblige, uh, forced to say no, they, they really don't. Just making the point that uh, people meet with the same conflicts over and over and over again. And while some things are affected by you know, technology, climate, and external forces, uh, by and large, people are making the same sorts of decisions and the same sorts of mistakes that they have always made. And they probably will keep on doing it, which is a sobering thought. Uh, does anyone know how the series ends? Well, I don't know. Are you counting me or not? Um, 
I'd have to say, if you do mean me, I'd have to say yes and no. I mean, I do know what the final scene is, but I don't know how we get there, no. Hey, what is your favorite scientific Easter egg that you've included in the series? Well, I think that would have to be the uh, entertaining bit where Claire invents ether and Brianna invents matches, both of which are, you know, obviously, you know, beneficial inventions leading to the good of mankind and uh, which end up blowing up their house and burning it to the ground. <laughs> or as Roger says, uh, it takes two scientific women <laughs> to, you know, destroy the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, so I like that one. Mm -hmm. Did you ever imagine that when you first started writing that you'd end up where you are today? Why or why not? Well, on a realistic level, no. I mean, it, the, this is very, and this doesn't happen all the time, nor does it happen to even very, very deserving novelists, which I don't necessarily think I am. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I did think I was meant to write novels, and uh, evidently I was. So um, if i saying that I ended up with, uh, you know, nine good novels to my credit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I imagined that I might end up here. <laughs> and thank you very much. Hmm. Have any of your characters started out as heroes and surprisingly turned into villains and vice versa, villain to hero? And if so, who were they and what changed your mind? Well, I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know that I have actually changed my mind about anybody. Usually I know whether a person is a hero or a villain. That doesn't mean you'll know. Uh, there is one very equivocal character in Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone. There's another one who is slightly less equivocal, but he will surprise you. Uh, the equivocal one, mm, you'll have to make up your own mind about him. Uh, was he a hero or a villain? You can't tell. He's very likable, I can tell you that much, but then villains often are. I mean, except for Black Jack Randall, you know, who is you know, obviously a villain. But I, I never thought that he was going to turn into a hero. Uh, oh, there's Frank Randall. Yeah, now where does he stand? Is he a hero, would you say, or is he a villain? Because he did, you know, take Claire back when she came back from the past. He did, you know, try to act as a good husband, as an honorable husband to her. He uh, took Brianna as his daughter, raised her, loved her, was a, was a very good father. But, you know, there's his attitude toward Jamie, you know. Of course, that's perfectly understandable once he knows who Jamie is. And also, once he finds out that Jamie survived in the past, you know, what is he going to do about that, you know? What can he do about that? How do you get at someone who's in the past? Well, now that's an interesting question, isn't it? Anyway, my mind was not changed. It's just that as I live with uh, one character or another, I see them in different situations. And uh, the same person can look very much like a hero or a villain, depending on the situation in which you place them and the way in which they respond to that. And some people respond badly in the case of an emergency. They just go to pieces and don't know what to do. This doesn't mean they're a bad person, though they might do something injurious, you know, in panic and frustration. But it doesn't mean that they're a villain. Uh, someone might, you know, deliberately do harm to someone else, but do it for a good cause, you know, say in defense of someone else. Or if you're in the army and so forth, you may have to, you know, kill perfectly innocent uh, people, innocent except that they're trying to kill you. But you have to do it. Does this make you a villain? I think not. Okay, so what is your favorite fun fact, surprising tidbit that you learned while researching bees? Ooh, goodness gracious. Hmm. Well, I learned a lot of things about bees, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, I knew quite a bit about bees to start with because of being a biologist and the fact that they are social insects. But you learn more as uh, more research is done. One thing I learned is that bees do not hibernate in winter, which quite surprised me. I thought they would, especially if they live in the mountains where it snows and things like that. But no, what they do is they go into their hives in the winter, uh, but they remain awake. Um, if the weather suddenly thaws, they'll fly out, you know, and look for food. Uh, but if not, they'll just stay in their hive and they cluster very tightly together and they, uh, they thrum their wings, just thrum, thrum from in unison, so you can hear this thrum coming from a hive. If you put your hand on the hive, you'll, hear, you'll, you'll feel the vibration of this thrumming. But by doing that, they're generating enough heat to keep the entire hive warm on the inside, which I thought was fascinating. Okay, you've said before that all your books have a shape. What shape does the entire book series have? Well, you know, I've never actually thought about that. Um, now, the books, uh, the shapes are fairly simple. You know, the Outlander is shaped like three pyramids. 
Um, there's three climaxes in that story when Claire is taken into the past, when uh, Jamie takes her to the Fregna Dune and invites her to go back to the future, and you know, then when he's kidnapped by uh, Black Jack Randall and, and uh, she has to save his soul from the, at the Abbey. Um, the others, they range in complexity as to what they're shaped like. Uh, Fiery Cross is shaped like a rainbow, which is very peculiar. Um, this book, these, this one is shaped like a snake. It uh, starts out all slinky and seductive and innocent, and then it starts looping, and it picks up, you know, these complexities from different people and different evolutions of, uh, of um, conflicts and what's going on at the time. So it builds up into a coil, and then you uh, get the other end of the snake. I'm not going to tell you which end is which. Well, actually, I will. The beginning is the tail. It has uh, just a little bit sticking up, going <laughs> and then it carries on. Shape of the entire book series, I couldn't possibly tell you. I'd have to sit and think about it for a while. It has a shape that I have never been asked to elucidate it before, and that would take some thought. Have you ever dreamed that you're conversing with any of your characters? No, no, oddly enough, I don't ever dream about the, the characters or what's going on in the books. I think it's because I do work at night, and by the time I shut down for the night at 4.30, I have a little going to bed ritual that I, I write in my journal, and it's you know not deep thoughts or anything like that. It's just a straightforward record of what I did during the day. You know, how far did I walk? Did I take the dogs out? You know, stuff like that. Where did we have dinner? Um, and uh, then I, I read a, a psalm or a chapter from the Bible, and uh, that uh, little process seems to empty my head so I can go down and, and sleep without worrying about anything. And uh, no, I never dream about that. I do have pretty wild dreams on occasion, but they're, they're just, <laughs> well, yeah, no, most of them don't make any sense at all, but they're very colorful. Uh, also, I converse, I don't converse with the characters. I am the characters. You know, when they're talking to each other, I may be either one of the people in that conversation or both at once, but uh, it, um, I'm not present in that conversation as an external presence, you might say, as an external intelligence. How do you keep track of all of the characters, their characteristics, appearance, timeline, etc.? Mm, well, no, that's a tricky question because I am very, very bad at telling how old people are or uh, what time it is. In other words, it's a huge struggle to keep the chronology straight, especially when you're going from known historical event to known historical event because you have to work out how long it would take people to get from point A to point B and things like that. Essentially, the characters and their characteristics, those are fairly easy because, you know, I can see them. These are, uh, you know, real people to me. Uh, you know, like the producer that I see just beyond the camera there, he's wearing a plaid shirt. I would, if I left the room and came back and left the room again, I would still remember that he's wearing a plaid shirt <laughs> because I've seen him in it all evening. Um, and it's pretty much that way with the characters as well. You know, I know who they are, and even if I have not worked with them for some time because I was in another part of the book, when I come back to them, it's, it's very easy to, to pick them up again, so to speak, and inhabit them. If you could estimate the time you put into the research you spend on each book, what would be the amount of hours? Man, I couldn't possibly tell you, because I do the research at the same time as I do the writing. I know a lot of people who are writing, writing historical fiction, but what they're really doing is research, because they keep saying, oh, I can't possibly start writing my book yet, I have more research to do. And what they think is that they have to know every single thing about the time that they're writing in before they can write a single word. Well, having seen people do this, I made up my mind when I was going to write a historical fiction for, uh, for practice not to do that. <laughs> I said the point here is to learn how to write a book, not to learn everything about Scotland in the 18th century. So I began writing and I've pursued that same philosophy. I work and when I get to a place where I actually need to know something, I will either stop and go and look it up if it's something complicated or if it's something minor like the name of a tree or a street, I just put square brackets and the word tree or street inside it and then I will pick those up the next time I come back and have time to go look those up. So um, I have no idea what would be the amount of hours. Uh, over seven years, you know, that's a lot of hours, thousands at least. Okay, when you started writing the series, you said you fought with Claire for a few pages, and then she took over telling the story. Does she still fight with you, or has she become more cooperative <laughs> over the course of the books? No, she, uh, well, I quit fighting with her, let's put it that way. Um, I don't bother trying to make her do things, she just is who she is, and uh, I kind of go along with her. Um, so you could say she's become more cooperative, but then again, so have I. 
Okay, have you ever written yourself into a corner with time travel? What was it? And how did you get out? Uh, actually not. I'm kind of careful about things like that. I see them coming. <laughs>